So thank you for joining us today um, and to Charles for being our kickoff speaker of our 2023-24 uh, uh, CBITS Digital Mental Health webinar, which is co-sponsored by the Society of Digital Mental Health. Um, and Charles, you can't see, but we have, um, it's also our T32 onboarding week. So we have a packed conference room joining. So um, it's just really fun. And we're really grateful that you're our opening presenter. Um, so it's my privilege and honor to introduce you. Um, this is Dr. Charles Jonasine, an associate professor of medicine and a practicing clinical health psychologist um, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, he, you'll hear about his uh, research, of course, but has clinical expertise in chronic disease self-management and cognitive behavioral therapy interventions, um, and has done extensive work um, with health disparities populations, namely adolescents and adults living with sickle cell disease. Graduated training um, from Duke University and Johns Hopkins um, School of Medicine, and currently funded through the NIH and PCORI uh, to lead programs, a program of research on sickle cell disease focused on designing and testing um, evidence-based digital health interventions for pain and mental health. We're so thrilled to hear your presentation and a lovely colleague, and we're just grateful you're here. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Absolutely ecstatic to be here. Uh, I've been following David and uh, his center and his work forever, ever. So I am absolutely honored to be here, David. You finally invited me. <laughs> anyway, Way too long. Should have been a long time before. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Right. Uh, so as Andrea said, I am a clinical psychologist, epidemiologist by training. I'm going to talk a little bit about sickle cell today um, and how we make digital health work for diverse communities. And that's really the question that I've been trying to answer um, for the last few years um, and, and specifically looking at pain and mental health. Uh, what I'll do is I am going to stop at a couple points in the talk. If there's any burning questions for you, please feel free to pipe up. Um, but otherwise, I'll just roll through. Uh, present my slides and end about uh, quarter two um, and be happy to take additional questions, et cetera, in, in conversation. Uh, so the, the first ideas I want to put forth is, uh, does confidence improve health? And, and more importantly, can we make you, can we make our patients, can we make the people that we're serving more charismatic? Um, and charis charisma is not something that you're just born with. It can be trained. It can be taught. Uh, and, and that's really the thrust of everything that we're doing is we're trying to make people healthier and better and enjoy their lives more, essentially by increasing their charisma. And, and the other piece is, is that by increasing charisma, can we make you healthier? Can we make you manage your health, your disease much better? And more importantly, can you manage pain and mental health in a different way because of charisma? And this is the major assumption. Uh, we all experience stress. That's one thing, even as a clinical psychologist, we're not able to stop. We're not able to stop the experience of stress. But understanding that, yes, stress is connected with pain, but the reason it's connected with pain is because there is this mediator, and that's, and that's coping, both psychological, uh, physiological, and also behavioral. Now, the overview of what we're going to talk about today uh, is first, I just want to do a very, very brief intro to sickle cell disease in case uh, nobody knows what that is. I'm sure that everybody's heard of sickle cell disease, but I just wanted to touch on it a little bit and why we're studying it. Uh, the stress pain problem and outline what that is and uh, talk about how we are aiming to improve pain management among adults and adolescents with sickle cell disease and I'll be able to give you just a little bit of our CBT trial, our six month outcomes, uh, which we just received. So you are only the third group now to have, to get to see these results. So very happy to show them, but they are very preliminary in nature. Sickle cell disease was actually first discovered in 1904. So it's really not that old. A medical student uh, pulled up this blood smear and noticed these oddly shaped cells. Um, and presented it to his attending physician. Um, and what they found out later on was that the red blood cells start off like this. We all know that nice round and sticky and squishy and pliable. Um, but in sickle cell with a mutation in the hemoglobin gene, uh, when the cells or the hemoglobin drop off oxygen at different areas of your body, they become hard and sickled and the hemoglobin deform. And so they form these rods. And so instead of being this nice pliable donut shape, the cells become hard and sticky. And it goes back and forth between these two shapes. So when the hemoglobin pick up oxygen from the lungs, 
then it goes back to this donut shape and then back and forth, back and forth. And that process uh, leads to hemolysis. But one of the things that is the hallmark of sickle cell disease is the pain. Uh, the pain is typically caused by this basal-occlusive episode, which happens when these red blood cells become hard and, stickly, and, and sickled and get stuck in these blood vessels here. Um, and the, the problem with that is that uh, not only is there this occlusion, but there's a lack of blood supply or a lack of oxygen supply to the cells on this end of the blood vessel, which leads to necrosis and other bad things. The other piece is that patients with sickle cell disease are chronically anemic. Uh, for our normal blood cells, they last about 90 to 120 days. And for our sickled red blood cells, they're only lasting about 15 to 30 days. So there's this really quick turnover of red blood cells and the body always has to reproduce cells. And so if you see a patient with sickle cell disease, sometimes they look like they're not malnourished, but maybe um, underweight. And part of that reason, and part of the reason is because the patients are just burning so many calories trying to produce these new red blood cells. Um, the other piece about sickle cell disease, I usually have a slide on this, is that you predominantly see sickle cell disease in Africa um, and parts of Asia where there is a high rate of malaria. And the heterozygote, so if you have one copy of the sickle gene, you are actually protected from malaria, uh, whereas obviously malaria can lead to death. But those individuals with one copy of the gene are protected from death, both from contracting malaria and also from dying from malaria. So in those areas where there's a high concentration of malaria, you see the sickle gene proliferate. Um, and those individuals with the copy are surviving longer than reproducing. And so that's why you see sickle cell disease be more common in these African countries or these Asian countries such as India and then also in the Middle East. But this is the thing that really got me interested in sickle cell disease is that one, you know, when I was uh, a graduate student, I was really interested in cardiovascular disease and what socioeconomic status and other racial factors um, might do to contribute to increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But we were still seeing individuals with cardiovascular disease dying in their 70s and even in their 80s. And yes, they were dying faster than their white counterparts or African-Americans were dying faster than their white counterparts. Uh, but the reality was it was like it was a long time waiting for these outcomes that we were looking at over that developmental period all the way from adolescence to the time that you become older and um, have your first heart attack, for instance. But in sickle cell disease, we realize that the life expectancy of these patients is 30 years less than it is for their non-disease counterparts. Um, and the other part is, is that this is a, um, a data set that I was able to uh, analyze while I was at Johns Hopkins. And this is the number of emergency department visits for a group of 260 adults with sickle cell disease, average age of about 30, 35. Now, majority of the patients with sickle cell disease are in the hospital for a pain crisis, like the basic occlusive pain crisis I was talking about before. So they're normally in the hospital about zero times per year. But there are these few patients here that have been in the emergency department over that 12-month period for 10, 20, some close to 30 times. So just imagine that every two weeks of the year, you're in the hospital for some acute issue. Now, this patient population, like who are these patients compared to these individuals where we rarely ever see them? But who are these patients? And that's the question. Um, and not only is it who are these patients, but are these visits preventable? So there must be some way to get these patients closer to these ones who are in the hospital zero times, because they both have the same genetic mutation. Uh, but there has to be something going on in the life of those patients that can be modifiable. Wally Smith, uh, back in 2005, and I present this just to show that nothing that I'm coming up with today or presenting today is new. Um, no ideas are, are mine. They're just basically standing on the shoulders of giants and emulating what they've tried to do over the last two decades. Um, Wally had this hypothesis that, of course, disease-related variables are associated with healthcare utilization, and maybe that's what's contributing to those individuals that you see in the hospital frequently. Um, and maybe a little bit demographic factors, but really it's these psychosocial variables that seem to be accounting for a lot of healthcare utilization. 
And back in 2005, when he started coming up, uh, started presenting these, these concepts, really nobody was thinking about psychosocial variables um, in this way and in terms of relating to healthcare utilization and sickle cell disease. It definitely wasn't measured in some of the larger sickle cell trials. And what Wally suggested was that there's maybe two uh, phenotypes. So there's a uh, Miss Jones. She has uh, poor access, low social support, and typically uh, manages or copes with stress via emotional coping. Um, and when Miss Jones, she has a season, experiences an increase in pain, immediately her level of distress increases. And of course, with that distress, she says, oh my goodness, I need to go to the ED. Goes to the ED, gets a prescription, feels a little bit better, but inevitably, and the rehospitalization rate, the 30-day rehospitalization rate for patients with sickle cell disease is about 40%. So the likelihood that they're going to be back in the hospital in 30 days is very, very, very high. Uh, but for Ms. Ms. Jones, of course, she experiences that expected increase um, in pain again. And then with that comes that level of distress, or maybe the distress comes before and then that pain increases. But instead of being able to manage his pain at home, Ms. Jones ends up to the ED and then gets admitted to the hospital for several weeks, which leads to a disruption of her day, uh, her daily life, and of course, her quality of life. Now, in contrast, Ms. Baker, she has good access to healthcare. She has high support, and perhaps she's managing stress with instrumental coping. And so Ms. Baker, she sees an increase or experiences an increase in her pain. Her distress level is, is relatively low because she has high self-efficacy and she knows exactly what to do. She goes and sees her clinician in the outpatient hospital or the outpatient clinic. Uh, she's able to get pain, uh, pain management. And then when she uh, resolves that pain episode, maybe the pain starts to increase again, but instead of going to the ED or getting rehospitalized, she's able to implement some of her home management strategies that stop her pain from increasing and then leading to healthcare utilization. And so two different, uh, the, probably the very similar, similar uh, profiles in terms of sickle cell disease, but different management approaches uh, for pain. Now, given the fact that distress always increases or seems to correlate with a cause or result from increases in, in pain or these acute pain episodes, I was always interested in trying to find out, does distress increase risk of acute care visits? So is it uh, the acute care visit that leads to distress or is it vice versa? Fortunately, I don't have that answer, but we were able to pull the few studies that do exist looking at low versus high hospitalizations, so three or more hospitalizations in a year. And I'm sure for many of you, you haven't been in a hospital for the last three years. Um, but looking at those individuals, so what differentiates those with low versus high healthcare utilization in that year? And we found out that looking at doing a systematic analysis, um, we found that those individuals with depressive symptoms or high depressive symptoms were 2.8 times more likely to be in that high healthcare utilization group. And so, yes, there was a connection between distress or depression in healthcare utilization. The directionality, we weren't able to tease apart in that systematic review, but at least that we know that it's indeed what all of these studies have been suggesting is correct, that there is a connection in some way. Now, given everything that everybody is, the, the, the background literature, we really wanted an easy way to be able to understand, hey, what is this connection between stress and pain and sickle cell disease? How can we collect this literature and make it in a way that we understand it? In addition, we wanted to make it in a way that our, our patients could understand as well. Uh, so we actually worked with patients to create this diagram. Um, it's actually the digital art was done by a, a patient that works with us who leads one of the uh, the uh, community-based organizations, uh, Sickle Cell 101, that, um, and, and that community-based organization, what they do is a lot of education via social media. So obviously doing digital art, I was much more likely to want her to do it than myself because the stuff that I do is completely ugly, but what she does is absolutely beautiful and she's used to educating using digital art like this. So, so what's better to take the biopsychosocial model, apply it to sickle cell and put it into a diagram 
an infographic that makes sense to both investigators, clinicians, and patients and families living with sickle cell disease. But anyways, and just a summary, it's just the external stressors like job loss, conflict, maybe discrimination in the healthcare system, um, the experience of stigma, uh, leads to negative thoughts. And I hear patients talking about this all the time, uh, just having feelings of low self-efficacy, catastrophizing self-doubt, uh, but more importantly, that perceived stress of being overwhelmed, feeling helpless, feeling like sickle cell is taking over their life and feeling a little bit out of control, um, and, and then experiencing depressions of, of, of experiencing uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, and one piece that uh, a little bit of research coming out of uh, Southern California has shown is that there's this physiological arousal that happens and it's increased among individuals with sickle cell disease. So that fight or flight response is actually more exaggerated in patients with sickle cell disease um, than African-Americans without sickle cell disease. And one, one experiment that they showed was that just the anticipation of pain. Uh, so they're doing a quantitative sensory uh, a protocol and they were saying, we're going to induce pain now. And immediately those individuals with sickle cell disease saw an increase in muscle tension, increase in heart rate, blood pressure, the adrenaline, the cortisol excretion, but more importantly, that vasoconstriction. And as you remember the previous slide that I showed, as the, the blood vessels need to stay dilated for those hard, sticky cells to get through and get to the organs where they need to go. But if you constrict your blood vessels in a normal person, that might be okay because our blood vessels are nice and pliable and squishy. But in sickle cell disease, they're hard, they're sticky, they get stuck. And so this stress um, response could actually lead to a pain crisis in sickle cell disease. And then of course, once you have that first pain crisis, you're in the hospital, you've been there for you know several days to even several weeks, you have these leg negative thoughts again, this perceived stress, like well, sickle cell has taken over my life, then you're feeling depressed and down, et cetera, right? And then, so it becomes this vicious cycle that we want to be able to intervene on. And so what we wanna be able to do is get rid of that low self-efficacy, get rid of that self-catastrophizing, and then get rid of that feelings of self-doubt. And then the question is, really, can we stop that stress-pain cycle? By addressing self-efficacy, catastrophizing that anxiety, that depression, those negative thoughts, can we improve how patients are managing their pain? Um, and unfortunately, there have no not been very many studies to actually look at behavioral interventions to do that, uh, but definitely something I'll talk about a little bit in our own clinical trial here. Anyways, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, just wanted to stop if anybody has any questions in the chat uh, before I get into cognitive behavioral therapy. Great, hearing none. We'll keep we'll keep going and feel free just to you know pop up your hand or pop something in the chat if something does come up, but I'll stop one more time before I get to the end. Uh, now, cognitive behavioral therapy is a gold standard non pharma pain treatment, improves self-efficacy. Uh, interestingly enough, there had been no clinical, large-scale clinical trials in sickle cell disease uh, to determine if cognitive behavioral works for pain in sickle cell. Uh, but the reason we don't do face-to-face -face cognitive behavioral therapy, all of you on this call know, is because there are several barriers to uptake. Um, there's a lack of available therapists, particularly culturally competent CBT therapists, and patients just really don't want to travel to face-to-face -face therapy, and oftentimes it's just a little bit too costly for patients to afford. And of course, that's why we try to do depression therapy or, or CBT without the therapist. Uh, computerized cognitive behavioral therapy or digital CBT has been around for decades now. Um, there is meta-analyses of meta-analyses that have demonstrated that it works. This is one meta-analysis that's a little bit old now. It's a little bit dated. Most of the studies are actually based out of the UK or Australia. Um, apart from this Clark, uh, these Clark et al. studies, I think there are no other American studies on this meta-analysis. And essentially, you know, overall, we find, and it was we do with all the meta-analysis, is a CBT. Um, when the CBT is uh, pers has personalized support or is health coach supported, we see relatively consistent moderate effect sizes for CBT, digital CBT versus control. Now, one thing to note, uh, there's a lot more studies now, but at this time, there was really no CBT studies that included African-Americans. So when we we're approaching this, we really thought, well, it's clear that cognitive behavioral therapy delivered via computer will work for uh, for whites, but will it work for African-Americans? Um, and that was a question we didn't have the answer to. See, there it is. 
Uh, so working with Bruce Roman was able to capitalize on his primary care study, which implemented the Beating the Blues program. That was a program that was offered only on the computer at the time. Um, and it was purchased by UPMC, brought over from the UK. And it's really just a standard CBT approach or digital CBT approach. It has eight lessons that patients can go through. Each of these lessons, they have these vignettes. So they had actors that were acting out their depression and their anxiety and talking about how they went through uh, cognitive behavioral therapy along with you. Um, and it's a very interactive, um, engaged e-learning experience. Uh, but still, uh, it's tough to get through these eight sessions. So in fact, I'll have to admit, I only got to the seventh session and I was like, okay, you know, I, I've, I've had enough. Um, but the same thing happened for our other African-American uh, participants in the study. So both groups um, seem to benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy, the digital CBT. Now, remember, this was those individuals who had a computer at home. So it is a very select group. So those individuals with a computer at home who participated in the computer CBT and reported that they had either anxiety or depression, elevated anxiety or depression symptoms, they did benefit from digital CBT. And we actually did a subsequent study uh, which found uh, that the African-Americans benefited more so from the digital CBT than the whites. But needless to say, what we did find is uh, that African-Americans only completed up to five sessions um, on average, whereas the whites in the study completed six and a half sessions on average. And now we're seeing consistently data showing that African-Americans or minorities are much less likely to engage with uh, digital interventions over the long term um, compared to whites. Uh, although there is an equal benefit, it seems like across the board, African-Americans are benefiting, even in um, just reading a recent study about um, um, digital CBT for sleep. And it seemed like that African-Americans benefited just as much as whites, but the engagement was less than um, that than that for whites. So really the question was, is that, okay, well, we know that digital CBT will work for black people. Um, for our research in sickle cell disease, what's next? Of course, the lack of engagement was, was an issue, but we really just wanted to see in a pilot study, will patients even use this? At first, we did a survey to see how many of our patients with sickle cell disease actually had a computer with internet access at home. Only 50% had a computer with internet access at home. Uh, so we realized immediately that computerized CBT was not gonna work. What was fortunate for us at that time was that UPMC made available a mobile version that you could get uh, via the web. And what we were able to do was give patients access on iPad minis. Um, and doing this, we were able to pilot trial digital CBT um, in sickle cell disease. Now this is for mental health specifically. So we wanted patients who had elevated depression or anxiety symptoms, 30 patients, baseline one, three and six months, we assessed PHQ, GAT7 and BPI. We also gave patients this uh, EMA app uh, we developed this back in 2010, specifically for patients with sickle cell disease. It hasn't really uh, changed that much over time, um, but it's just a standard EMA app where you're asking pain level zero to 10, you ask it daily. And then we also ask PHQ items, but in the present rather than over the last two weeks, PHQ and GAD2 items. Uh, what we were able to do across Pitt and Vanderbilt, which was the collaborating institution, both sites had a clinical psychologist, me at Pitt, uh, and then I had a colleague at Vanderbilt that was able to assess all the patients who reported depression and anxiety symptoms. And among those 63 at the two sites, among those 63 that had elevated symptoms, so they came in, they did an assessment, they said, on that assessment, you know what? I'm having extreme depression or anxiety. We only approached 39. And so this is one of the issues with implementation. Now I've always, I've always uh, tried to advocate for doing screening because even just the screening itself is an intervention, but it's not an intervention if you don't actually speak with the patients about what they've, what they've entered. Um, I'm gonna stop in a second, I'll answer those two questions. Uh, I'll just get over this one, one little study. Uh, consented and randomized 30, we had CBT did 18 and then 12 went to treatment as usual. So all they got was the pain and mood tracking. Now, of course, it's only 30 individuals. So the data looks a little bit messy. 
but uh, hopefully I don't make any of the statisticians on the call gag. Uh, but what we did is we did the predicted means and it came out a little bit more clearly that the control group, the treatment as usual group, did not improve on their mean PHQ scores. However, you see the CBT group almost saw about a four point decrease in their PHQ scores. Now, of course, it's just a policy that we didn't intend to see any significant effects um, and this didn't reach significance, but at least the trend was going in the right direction. And then we saw something very similar for pain, that daily pain diary. We saw an increase in pain for the diary group with the treatment as usual, but I mean, the treatment as usual group, but the CBT group actually showed a decrease in daily pain over time. So very, very interesting. And this actually was a significant effect, uh, but was not our primary outcome. So. Um, now, the, the last thing I'm going to say about the study is, is that it's not really about the effects, but it's about the qualitative feedback and whether patients were actually willing to use CBT. Um, and for the patients, it gives a lot of great feedback. They like the they like the training program. They like the skills that they were getting. But the educational vignettes, like the actors, they were not relatable. They didn't see anybody with sickle cell. They didn't see anybody that looked like them. And that was a major, major issue for our patients. And so our next step really was can we uh, can we address those concerns that patients had? Now, uh, just quick, is there is there an insight why the engagement of minorities is lower than that of whites? I don't know. There's a lot of questions. It's interesting because obviously we know that um, African Americans are less likely to engage with mental health treatment just across just across the board. Um, but we thought that if we can adapt CBT and make it so that it's easier to access, you'd be able to eliminate all those barriers that um, African-Americans typically talk about when they're talking about mental health. The one thing we're not able to address though is the stigma. Um, and the other thing is the competing demands uh, that patients have when they're coming from maybe a lower uh, socioeconomic uh, background, they have a lot more they have family responsibilities, maybe work is a little bit more arduous. Uh, and so it's just a little bit harder to organize life. And so staying on a program for that long, it just becomes really, really problematic. They don't have like a nice room or a nice office to go into and get on their CBT program. They're more likely sitting with the CBT program on a couch with five other people who are watching TV and there's just a lot of confusion um, and, you know, and chaos uh, running around. The other piece about that though, too, is, is that, hey, we need to make it so that, you know, it's, it's relevant and relatable. Uh, we want to make sure that patients are, are, are seeing themselves in the programs that we're offering. And right now, you know, patients, patients don't because it's always been designed uh, for majority populations, you know, people from the UK, people from Australia. Uh, people who can afford digital CBT here and here in the states. So you'll see a lot more research now as we're starting to tailor these. Um, obviously, face-to-face uh, -face interventions have been tailored for uh, African Americans for a long time, but you know we're just starting to see it now. Interesting to note that lower levels of engagement in digital intervention for Black individuals, but still impact is the impact relative to the engagement, or are you seeing similar levels of impact despite less engagement? That's a great question. Um, we actually are seeing similar levels of impact despite engagement. So individuals who were offered the, the program and did not get on, they actually benefited um, as well. Now that said, the more that you use it, the more you're, you're going to benefit. So we saw that across the board and there's no race differences in that, just the amount of engagement improves um, the amount of benefit that you do get. But for folks that didn't even, who just got offered the program, they still benefited on, the, on, on a Bruce, Bruce Rollman study with the primary care. Uh, which was really interesting to see. Uh, and did the control group receive anything? Uh, no, all they received was uh, they didn't have any uh, kind of engagement uh, with the health coach or anything like that. All they had was the tracking. Uh, so it really was a legitimate control group. All right, all right so just quick, uh, what we decided to do is given the fact that the point that I was making about making things relevant and relatable to your population, uh, you'll hear this a lot with community groups, particularly in single cell disease. They'll say, hey, nothing for us without us. If you're going to make an intervention, you're going to make. Sorry, my wife was trying to find me. Um, so if, if if you're trying to make something for this group, you need to include them. You need to keep them as partners. And we all know this, uh, but because of the challenge and the time that it takes to create those relationships and to engage folks, um, we trim times and we're always under a deadline, right? We're always uh, have our timeline and it's hard to engage and partner with um, the community or the patients that we're trying to 
we're trying to reach. Uh, but the reality is, is that you need to do this. Uh, otherwise, the uptake of what we're doing is going to be really, really poor. Um, and what we were able to do was not only were we able to get warrior stores with patients living with sickle cell disease to talk about their stress and how they're managing, uh, but we we're also able to talk, uh, have patients teaching the cognitive behavioral therapy and the education side um, and our educational components of how to manage sickle cell disease. So this was really a program, this digital CBT program that we created was really done by the patients for the patients. And, you know, that was one of my huge, uh, one thing that I would call a huge success was being able to develop this, not only just with patients, but having patients featured on it. So in fact, we had a lesson that I did um, it was the very first lesson. It was the uh, SMART goals because everybody, you need to start off your CBT with SMART goals, right? Um, and that was a patient, the, 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 the program or the session that patients liked the least. Um, and of course, it helps that I had really engaging patients. So Smalls, she was extremely engaging. Um, uh, Michelle, she's 50 years old for patients with sickle cell disease. They've rarely seen somebody with sickle cell who's over 40, um, let alone 50 years old. So there was just something about the patients that were on the videos that were really engaging. Whereas even myself, and you know, I do I do these video presentations a lot. Um, there's just something that I was not, you know, there's no there's something that was not just captured, one that was not capturing their attention. So we actually remove we didn't remove that video lesson but we just made it optional and so we had it so the patients went directly to the the to the other sickle cell warriors teaching rather than myself uh, we were fortunate enough to be funded by the patient center outcomes research institute um, and and these are the institutions the clinical institutions also uh, vandermilk came on later because we saw a slow in enrollment uh, but the real champions of this were our cbo's our community-based organizations sickle cell 101 sickle cell warrior sickle cell community consortium um, the thing the the work that they're doing is much more impactful in the community than the work we're doing of course we have the studies we have the papers we have the conference presentations but they're the ones actually touching patients uh, sickle cell 101 they reach um, hundreds of thousands uh, of patients all over the world. Uh, and they're the ones who actually developed the education side of this program. And what we were able to do was compare digital CBD to digital education. For anybody who's done a PCORI before, you know, it, it, I would approach doing a PCORI if you haven't with uh, trepidation um, because they ask for a lot. But uh, they want two active interventions and the active and the interventions have to exist. Uh, so they can't be funded by the PCORI. They have to be there. Uh, so really, we had to take we took Sickle Cell 101's intervention. We had them do some videos or, or create some videos in the same style as our digital CBT videos. Uh, but we really had to use these pre-existing interventions, which the digital CBT program I created when I was on my K ward. So you can understand how well funded that was and what the quality of that was overall. But still, um, still they came out great. And what we did was we had an e-kiosk and talk about it a little bit uh, to assess whether patients had chronic pain. In our first study, we found that mental health obviously was an issue. 25% well, of patients had elevated mental health, uh, depression, and anxiety, but really it was uh, the pain, the chronic pain that patients were suffering with the most. And so by getting patients with chronic pain into the study, we were also capturing those patients with elevated depression and anxiety. Um, and indeed, we found in this study, actually, that over 10% of our patients, 10% uh, of our patients reported significant uh, suicidal ideation, uh, which is something I didn't expect. And we did this study during the pandemic, which may have exacerbated those feelings. But needless to say, uh, we randomized one-to-one -to, -one to digital CBT versus digital education. As I mentioned before, CBT does not work unless you have a health coach. This hasn't been shown in sickle cell disease, but we mainly needed the health coach to ensure that there would be engagement with the app or with the intervention. Uh, the health coach was only going to be there to touch base with the patients for 12 weeks. And then after that, patients were on their own. They could contact the health coach if they needed to get some additional support, but really the intervention stopped at 12 weeks. Main outcome of pain interference was at six months, and then 12 months was that longer outcome. We got healthcare utilization, opioid um, prescriptions, et cetera, which I don't have these data today, but I can present this six month uh, data, all right? I know I went through that a little bit quickly, but uh, you know, just uh, I do wanna make sure we have some time for some questions. Um, and again, I have tons of slides. So if there's any questions about anything, I probably have a data slide on it. All right. So the major challenges with sickle cell disease, 
I, I mentioned earlier on why we should be doing sickle cell work is because the outcomes are coming so quickly, the negative outcomes, unfortunately, morbidity, mortality, pain, um, and these things, we are being able to observe them. We have patients who have gone through two hip transplants before they're age 30. Uh, so in terms of being able to see an impact of what you're doing, you can see it almost immediately. And the other thing is, is there's just a lack of studies. And part of the reason is, is that as you see uh, an examination of clinicaltrials.gov, 14% of sickle cell trials close due to low enrollment versus 5% close for thalassemia trials. So both benign hematology, um, but you see a much lower attrition or um, um, uh, a much better enrollment rate for these thalassemia trials. You know, why, why is that the case? And then uh, the number of trials that actually lead to a published manuscript, 35 versus 60%. So getting into sickle cell research is not for the faint of heart, particularly trying to do a large scale trial. Um, and as a junior person starting out, you know, it really is one of the major challenges that you have to think about uh, when trying to do a large multi-site trial. Uh, the other part is, is we know that the completion rate for digital health studies is only really about 50%. Now we see varying numbers of also saying 10% um, in terms of like dropout, but really the completion rate for the whole program, the intervention that you provide to patients, really, if you look across studies, it's only about 50%. So even among white or majority populations, we're seeing a ton of dropout in digital health. And this is really an area that I'm very, very interested in is how can we get people and keep people engaged with our digital interventions? Because uh, as what somebody commented, it's it's really the more you use it, the better you're going to benefit, the more you're going to benefit. And so how do we actually do that? So I have a couple ideas and, and I'll get to the punchline. Um, I, I can't say that we were successful in our engagement, but I do think that there's a lot of lessons here, lessons learned here that we can we can take to our next trial. Uh, so first of all, the kiosk, the e-kiosk, I think is a fantastic idea. If you wanna get multi-site studies go going, yeah, you really need to make them decentralized. So make sure that the burden is very low on the CRCs or the clinical research coordinators in that team at the site. Because reality is nobody cares about your study as much as you do. So when you're trying to get people excited about enrolling for your site, it is a lot easier to do that when they have very little work to do. Uh, what we did is we set up a kiosk, a little iPad kiosk in each of the clinics. It ended up, we gave them these stands, but they really didn't use these stands. They more so carried the iPad around and handed it to patients. And once they, the patient was able to get onto the iPad, and again, we also had some community-based organizations for them to participate in enrolled patients, we had to make this a virtual or a virtual enrollment as well. So the virtual patients also saw the same e-kiosk online. They just followed a link um, from, uh, from a social media post or a website, or et cetera, um, and they were able to participate in the trial just the same way the people from the clinic. So once a person got onto the e-consent, we screened them to determine whether they had chronic pain. Uh, and were eligible, they had to have sickle cell, they had to be an adult, they could consent right there on the iPad and then start doing their baseline questionnaires um, right there on the iPad. So it was absolutely uh, all self-contained and the CRC at this point didn't have to do anything. But of course, one of the key things was, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually done an e-consent video before, uh, but the consent video that we did was absolutely critical for, for um, engaging our patients and what they're doing. Uh, because we often make this mistake we often enroll a patient, realize they don't understand the, the study that they just enrolled in, then try to explain the study them to them. And then we get upset because they're not engaged or they've fallen off or they're not completing their time points. And then we try to engage them once we realize that they're falling off. But we need to do this backwards. We need to do this in the opposite direction. We want to engage our patients, explain in detail what the study is, but in a language and in a way that they can understand, not in a 15-page consent document, so if you're giving patients 15 pages consent documents, shame on you. Uh, but once they understand, we even did a consent quiz, and I know some of you all are, are doing that as well. Uh, but the consent quiz is really helpful um, in just in assessing understanding. And mind you, a lot of our patients who were screening dropped out because of the consent quiz, um, actually, which is uh, another point of discussion. But only once they explain or they understand the study, then you enroll. So you make sure that people on your study are really enrolled for the right reasons. 
Uh, the other thing is, is that everybody, we're using technology, so everybody gets an alert. Everybody gets excited when uh, we have a new patient on. The CRC at that site is able to uh, uh, talk with the patient, with our participant, make sure that they get logged on to the study. For those who are virtual, they have a phone number that they can reach out to somebody who's there. It's not really 24-7, but at least we make it seem that way. Um, and then that's it. From the comfort of their own home, they're able to do the daily pain and mood tracking, um, and then they engage with the CBT app. Now, the CBT and education app were both via Facebook Messenger, and it was an automated chatbot. So I'm really excited about AI and the use of AI to expand what we're doing with the chatbot. It was a scripted chatbot, and it wasn't really AI at this point, but it did have different decision trees, so you would get different responses based on how you answered. At the end of the day, though, everybody saw the same videos. Um, and that would be a really cool idea is to present different videos based on what you chose, but, you know, with the limited budget and limited uh, resources, what we had. Uh, but the key really was, is that patients could do this in the comfort of their own home. They didn't have to come back to the clinic, get a blood draw, uh, to get a blood draw. And the other piece was, is that a health coach would contact them within 24 hours. Now, this didn't always happen within 24 hours. There's a lot of patients that we missed. In fact, we had to actually stop the study because we didn't have enough health coaches to meet the need of the patients. Uh, so we had such a flood of patients coming onto the study um, that we really could not get enough support. And what we thought was, is that it would be a couple staff that would be doing the work to address all 350 patients. But in reality, we had to get volunteers. And the people who volunteered were people from the community. And now the, the health coaches then ended up being, for the most part, peers. Um, so Vanessa is just one of our 22 uh, um, health coaches um, that we had on. But for the majority, it was patients and people who are advocates or parents of those living with sickle cell disease. And that was not intended. That was actually designed uh, that we would hire staff to serve as, as health coaches. But we had 22 coaches over the two years. They did 80 percent. Um, they had an 80 percent hit rate for people who were able to get on the phone with them for at least that first session, if not 12 sessions. Uh, but for about four sessions on average, which as a clinical psychologist, if I can get somebody from the community with me for four sessions, that's that's an absolute success. So I was ecstatic to see that we were able to do that. And that's 1,500 sessions um, or more uh, for a group that would have never received it otherwise. And the other thing that was a highlight was that the peers themselves became a community and really started to support each other. Um, and we connected at different conferences, et cetera, but I can talk more about that later. Um, trial outcomes, so the promise pain interference, like I said, not sure why it's clicking, the daily pain zero to 10 over two week periods. And then the mechanistic variable that we looked at, there's there a few others, um, outcomes variables, but I'll just talk about these three. And that was a sickle cell specific self-efficacy scale um, and looking at their confidence of managing their sickle cell disease. And, and, and you may have seen that we have been working on this product called Painimation, and it's really using pain animations and graphical displays for patients to be able to communicate their pain. And the key thing is here, you see very few words, very few words, because we don't always know when patients are understanding the, the, uh, the questionnaires that we're giving to them. Um, and so giving them a bunch of adjectives and phrases uh, really is not it, it is not reaching our patients where they're where they're at, where they are. So we'd love to discuss this at, at a later date. Uh, but still, uh, the trial I was very happy to see that we actually met our recruitment goal, which in and of itself was an absolute success. And again, really, it was the community that did it for us. Uh, the the majority of recruitments really uh, came from the clinical sites, but a huge proportion did come from the virtual arm or the CBOs as well. We randomized 359, uh, digital CBT was about equal. And now this is one point uh, that is, is challenging is the retention over six months. That's a long time uh, for anybody to be involved in a study. Uh, and so in fact, even the daily diary, we didn't want to burden patients. So we stopped the notifications for the daily diary and patients thought that the study ended. Uh, but we would only do the notifications for tw uh, for two weeks at each time point. Uh, but you know, the feedback we got from the patients was we want to keep getting those notifications. Uh, the age group, uh, just as we'd expect, about 35 on average. A uh, majority are female. Uh, there was a little bit of a racial distribution, uh, more mixed race uh, than typical, and then uh, a little bit of Hispanic, Latino ethnicity. But for the majority, uh, Black or African-American. 
primary and secondary trial outcomes. Now, uh, the, the result is everybody benefited. Everybody benefited. Now, remember, these were two active controls. We were supposed to have equipoise and not suspect that CBT was better than education or vice versa. And reality was neither was better. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that was. Uh, but this was a significant drop for both groups. It wasn't a huge decrease on the promise. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, like two, two tenths of a standard deviation. So not a huge drop, but still that was significant. And the interesting thing was for pain intensity over the diary, uh, the 12 week diary time points, uh, the, the, there was no change over time. Uh, so for both groups, uh, there was no change in pain interference, which I think is interesting. Our use of the zero to 10 scale for pain outcomes or clinical trials using pain, patients have often said that it's not effective. They can't express their pain using the zero to 10 scale. And so I think that this, this kind of supports that point. And I'll try to rush through. Uh, no, it's, unfortunately, I went a little bit slow at the beginning. Um, last thing that I wanted to say about the outcomes is that we did not see a significant uh, difference in self-efficacy, but the six-month change for CBT and self-efficacy slightly increased. So the actual mean, I believe, was 42. Uh, so 1.4 is not huge, but over the 300 folks, this is a significant change, uh, but not enough that it's different than the M education. But it would be really curious to see whether that um, holds over time. Now, this is the, the bad news of this, of this trial is that the number of people that never connected with our chat bot on Facebook Messenger was 25% overall. So a quarter of the population never connected. And then those who connected but never started a lesson, um, that was another uh, 10 to 20%. Those individuals that actually finally completed one lesson was only was less than 50% of the population. So the reality is, is that we found that there was engagement, about 80% engaged with the health coach at least once, had a phone call, or at least had a significant chat exchange. Um, so the majority connected with the health coach, but less than half the patients actually did the digital intervention. So why is this? So first thing is Facebook. In 2018, when we proposed this, everybody was on Facebook. By the time we got the study going, nobody wanted to be on Facebook. In fact, uh, people uh, were deleting their Facebook accounts. Um, and so uh, nobody wanted to be uh, wanted to get back on Facebook Messenger to use the study. We had this really complicated password system. Uh, and you can see people chatting in the chat bot like, I don't know what my passcode is. Right. Uh, so the, the, the lesson here is we wanted to make it secure, but you just got to keep it simple, stupid. Uh, no notifications or nudges. When we were starting the study, Messenger let us notify and remind people to get back on it. By the time the study started enrolling, Facebook uh, took away that option for us. So, so those are some of the main reasons why, but the qualitative data that we get for patients is that they really like the lessons. If they did them, they really liked them. Uh, but the reality is, is that the method that we were delivering it, the vehicle uh, was not the appropriate vehicle. So there's a lot of issues with the implementation of it there. So in summary, uh, so we had high engagement with the health coaches, poor engagement with the digital intervention, no treatment differences in outcomes, you know, but the reality is, is that everybody improves. Um, and the health coaches were really the key uh, piece of that. We see some effect of self-efficacy or some effect of CBT on self-efficacy. Would love to look at those 50% that actually engage with the digital intervention to see if the self-efficacy, uh, if we see a, a improvement in self-efficacy among those individuals. So we really need to do a, a sub-analysis to see the more uh, the people that actually did the intervention, did it actually make an impact? Um, and then the next steps, uh, subgroup analysis, like I said, test self-efficacy, uh, but we just got funded for this UG3, UH3 uh, to do 17 sites. Uh, this is gonna be the adolescents and young adults, the most challenging group, actually, the most challenging group to treat and to uh, retain or enroll in studies. Uh, this is 16 to 30 groups. So that's why uh, our, our community advisors want us to do this group. Uh, but this is going to be great because we're actually going to test digital CBT and digital education with and without the health coach support. So this is something that hasn't been done in sickle cell disease. We know that health coach support is going to help, but we actually get to do the clinical trial um, to prove it. So um, so that's that's it for me. Just have to thank, obviously, our community uh, groups and participants, because without them, we could have never done this. Um, so thank you uh, for allowing me to talk about this really important topic. I'm looking at the chat now. Let's open this up for questions. That was awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sorry I had to speed up at the end there. Apologies. No, this was outstanding. And it, it's great you could see some of these questions. So we have um, the first one from Benji, if you're able to take that one. Yeah, so Benji says the patient created content was great. Thank you very much. I think so as well. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it was really a labor of love. I wonder if you also consider using existing online content like YouTube videos made about single cell from more experienced content creators. Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, I tried to reach out. That's why we reached out to Sickle Cell 101 because uh, they had done a fantastic job in the past of engaging folks in digital education um, via Instagram. They have tons of followers, et cetera. And for any of you who've tried to do a Facebook page or a Facebook group, it really isn't possible uh, to create something organically. You have to be very, very engaging. You have to do a lot of work, and they've been able to do it. Uh, so we work with them. There's this other uh, group that does uh, this site called Sickle Cell Memes. Absolutely hilarious. Uh, so we tried reaching out to them. We tried reaching out to a couple other folks to get content. But, yeah, no, it's a great question, Benji, and that's definitely the this next step in the future is to get some of these other content that are already out there and bring them in. And maybe not so much the educational content, but the things that are really engaging to patients. Uh, next one from Samantha. Out of curiosity, is there any path forward that would potentially incorporate a modified pain scale? I know from being in a chronic illness space, the standards or the temp scale is often difficult for chronic pain patients. Um, effective having providers take their self-assessment seriously. The, the VA pain scale, I've, I've not seen that one, but I'm really excited about, let me see if I can pull this up here. Hold on a second. So this is one thing, uh, when we ask patients to talk about their pain using pictures, they do an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, so in, that, in fact, some providers have been actually using images, and this is from a pediatric sickle cell provider. Uh, she actually creates this for the patient. So they have images to translate that zero to 10 scale. Because I think I agree with you, uh, Samantha, it's, it's the using the zero to 10 scale, and I think other providers do too, it's just not effective for patients. They don't know what, like, what does a five mean? I mean, excruciating pain, uh, it's not a 10 out of a 10, it's a thousand out of 10. So being able to use these images has been really critical for patients. Um, and we've gone through a lot of human, oh, this is the other piece. Patients are not seeming to understand what these self-report scales are asking. They're interpreting it in a completely different way at times. We found in the brief pain inventory, I'm, I'm sure if you've done pain work, you've used the brief pain inventory. We've done two different studies now. Uh, we've 88% on this uh, study had errors. This was something we were doing in the clinic and I was administering this form. 88% um, had errors on it. So it was either incongruent, like so worst is five, least is seven. And this is pretty consistent. Even on a neurocognitive study, we found 25% of them had incongruent uh, numbers here. So either they're they're rushing through, um, but we actually found on this cognitive study is that patients' spatial reasoning skills were correlated with their ability to do this test um, or errors that they were making on this test. But part of it is not even just errors, it's just how they interpret it. So anyways, all that to say is that I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, that the way that we're doing these scales is, is really wrong. But I think this, these animations are so cool. Like the way that you're able to say, hey, look, you know, my pain feels like this, right? Instead of, uh, my pain is a six out of 10 and it feels stabbing. Um, in terms of creating empathy for our, um, from our providers, you know, you, know you, re you really need to do something a little bit more creative than just using words and numbers, I think. So, you know, happy, happy to, if, I'd love to see the modified VA scale. If you could send that to me, I could put my email in the chat because um, we are really, really curious about ways to improve uh, how we're measuring pain. Uh, and the, the key thing is, is that you can't come up with good pain treatments unless you know how to assess the outcome, unless you're doing it accurately. Because uh, otherwise it's, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, maybe you see an improvement, maybe you don't. And you don't really know if patients are improving. So just like we saw in my trial, uh, we saw improvements in all these other outcomes, catastrophizing, quality of life, anxiety, depression. But on the zero to 10 scale, we saw no improvement. So is that, a real effect or is it just the the limitations of the zero to 10 scale? So, yeah, so I think it's a great question. So sorry to get on my soapbox about that. Well, if we have a couple of more minutes, uh, I, I, I actually am sort of curious, just a, a more general question, but I was really intrigued by, you know, your kind of getting forced into using peer coaches and, which, because I really think that's a that's a you know a, 
for digital health generally is 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 you know potentially really useful for for being able to scale. Um, can you say a little bit more about like how you trained them, what the experience was like, and and then the other thing that I'm sort of curious about with is sort of the the, the potential benefit you alluded to it the potential for coaches as well. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then and to answer your last question, I wish that we measured outcomes among our coaches because uh, it was very clear that they received a lot of benefit. We had weekly uh, supervision sessions. Uh, for the most part, I was there for the first couple of years, but then just transitioned it to another uh, patient living with sickle cell disease who was, who was able to do the supervision. Um, <clears throat> so we started out, uh, we started out with the training when we realized that we needed to get volunteers and we paid them a little bit. We paid them, we were able to pay them through Picor. We were able to pay them for data entry. Uh, but, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the no amount of time they were putting in, they were doing 30 minute sessions, which we told them 20 minutes max, but they're on average, they were going over. <laughs> um, and so they were spending a lot of time doing this and we were only paying them a little bit. Um, and so it was, it was really difficult, but we were paying them mostly for their training because the first training we wanted to do, we did this twice and realized we couldn't do it, was uh, we had a six hour session on Saturday. Our first session was uh, five folks. You know, that went okay. Um, we, only, we only got two people from that. Our next session, once we advertised a little bit more, we got 22 adults who were interested in participating. After that six session, uh, six hour session, only two came back because uh, what we had was two weeks of subsequent four hour sessions broken up into four uh, four meetings. And so really we've we've been and we're working on this now for the UG3. Um, we're really trying to figure out what that balance is, uh, because the reality is, is that a lot of our health coaches weren't trained, didn't have a background in psychology. Like, so yes, there, there was one family therapist. Uh, there was a social worker. Uh, so there were some folks who were trained um, in how to deliver therapy, but for the most part, it wasn't like I was going to emulate myself. Um, it, but truth is, is that, you know, the outcomes look better than the outcomes that, you know, that I would have had to be absolutely honest with you. So, so I think it's, it's still an open question of like to what, how much training is too much and how much training is enough. Um, so our, our WIPIC, our Western Psychiatric Institute, they have a peer um, coaching, uh, peer support model that they've been using. But the training is really intensive. Um, but uh, those peers are able to get paid and they're able to reimburse. So we're, we're trying to see if there's a an easy way to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know to what extent uh, you or anybody else on the call has experience. But it's it, I'm really curious about this. I agree with you. I think it's the future for digital health. Delivery. Yeah, it's, it's you know, many states now have certifications for, for yep. peer trainers. It is part of, it sounds like, uh, sounds like Pennsylvania does. So yep. um, it's... Yeah, no, I'm really interested. I, I think that the one thing we can use with uh, our digital for is to increase the amount or the ability for real people to make touch points. You know, mm -hmm. rather the health system, if you speak to UPMC, they want to replace people because people are expensive. Uh, but really, I think things are going to change a little bit where we're just maximizing what these touch points can be uh, for real people. So, yeah. Well, this was amazing. Check the comments because there's the new scale i'm noticing um oh great i'm gonna put it live so everyone can see it um but um thank you i just like david said, i've read out all these more questions i have for you and just lots of research ideas so thank you so much for this amazing presentation and um this was awesome thank you yeah and thanks everybody for great comments uh and discussions it's fantastic hopefully i'll get to see you all in person one day i certainly hope so all right have a good one thank you thank you Bye-bye.